Uh, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 11847 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of amendments to the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland Bill. I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11847. Uh, no member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 11847 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. Next item of business is stage three amendments to the civil litigation expenses in group proceedings Scotland bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, that is SP bill 14A, the marshal list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshal list of amendments. And I call group one, amendment 34, in the name of Margaret Mitchell, in a group on its own. Margaret Mitchell, please, to move and speak to Amendment 34. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. For an ordinary member of the public, understanding civil litigation can be a complex and confusing process. The Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Bill seeks to increase access to justice. It introduces, under success fee agreements, provision whereby a lawyer using a damage, damages-based agreement can take a share of their client's compensation for injury, which can include both past and future loss. Amen Amendment 34 therefore seeks to ensure the bill's provision give the consumer protection by ensuring that the injured pursuer has the relevant information to make informed choice about whether to accept the terms of the success fee agreement on offer where the damages are awarded not by a court, but through a negotiated settlement. The amendment ensures that before the success fee is agreed, which can include damages-based agreement, the solicitor or provider has explained in writing to the client how the terms of the success fee agreement would determine the fee payable in relation to the different element of damages that may be obtained. The onus is on the lawyer to state in writing that the amount being taken as part of the, is as part of the lawyer's fee is fair and reasonable. It also ensures that the client has confirmed in writing that they have understood and agreed to the terms of the agreement. In addition, Amendment 34 ensures that after an offer of damages is received, but before it's accepted, the recipient fully understands how much of the damages are being paid to their lawyer and in particular to what extent the part of the offer that relates to damages for future loss is being claimed as part of the lawyer's fee. It's important to recognise future loss is awarded to an injured pursuer to cover their future care which can include lost earnings while an in injured person is off work recovering or travel expenses for expected future hospital appointments. In more serious personal injury cases, it could cover loss of all future earnings, as well as costs of future care and specialist equipment which may be needed. So it is crucial an injured pursuer fully understands, if their case is successful, how much of their future loss entitlement, which can va vary from very complex care needs will instead go towards their solicitor's fee. In addition to this, the amendment ensures the lawyer must provide a certificate that the fee payable is fair and reasonable in the circumstances of the case and that no conflict of in interest or undue influence has arisen, which also provides protection for the lawyer. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, in her remarks at stage two, the Minister indicated that she thought the Law Society should be responsible for providing, in essence, this client protection. But as the Law Society lobbies for the best interests of its members, 
I do not believe it is best placed to set out what form this protection would take after the bill has been passed. By contrast, Amendment 34 sets out now provisions on the face of the bill to ensure both transparency and openness in a success fee agreement and that an injured pursuer has the necessary information to enable them to make an informed choice as to whether to accept the agreement or not. As such, the amendment provides checks and balances which serves to protect both solicitors and clients from any underlying potential conflict of interest. I move Amendment 34 in my name. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I share many of Margaret Mitchell's concerns, and indeed I think it's important to note Margaret Mitchell's uh, 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 ingoing comment around the proposals set out in this bill are about increasing access to justice. As we do so, it is important that individuals bringing forward cases do so in the fullest possible knowledge, and indeed that their interests are protected. However, we do not support this amendment um, for the following reasons. I think, first and foremost, it introduces an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy. Requiring these arguments and these reasons to be set out in writing does not necessarily protect clients' interests in the way that Margaret Mitchell sets out. But critically, I think that the, the argument uh, that has been made by some in the legal profession is that it would prevent the so-called at-the-court-door settlements, which are very often in the client's best interest, pre preventing uh, court action and arriving at an agreement that does uh, 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 ensure that the client's interests are looked after. But perhaps uh, finally, and indeed to the, the uh, comments just made uh, by Margaret Mitchell regarding the Law Society and who is best placed to look at these, lawyers in the end of, of the day and in the final analysis are a highly regulated profession. Solicitors uh, uh, undergo a great deal of scrutiny and indeed they are required by law in order uh, to uphold their clients best interests. If there is an issue here I would suggest that it would uh, uh, suggest a much wider issue with the profession and one which would be best looked at from a, a regulatory point of view rather than through the specifics of, the, of this bill. So for these reasons uh, we will not be supporting Amendment 34. Thank you. Liam McArthur. President, obviously, like Daniel Johnson, I think Margaret Mitchell very fairly identifies uh, an issue in terms of the access to justice is predicated on there being a level of transparency and a level of predictability in terms of uh, what uh, any litigant might um, expect from the, the process. But I, again, like Daniel Johnson, I share some of those concerns about uh, the, the proposals within this amendment putting in place something that I think in practice would come to be seen as fairly cumbersome and, and not necessarily in the best interests uh, of the individual. Um, as Margaret Mitchell has, has rightly identified, the Law Society themselves uh, are developing proposals. I think this is probably one of those areas where, with a five-year review clause built into the, uh, the legislation, there will be an opportunity uh, to keep under review whether or not those uh, processes uh, that the uh, Law Society are undertaking to, to, to bring forward are fit for purpose. But uh, on that basis, and for the reasons that uh, Daniel Johnson has identified, uh, we will not be supporting the amendment. Minister. Presiding officer, at the outset I would wish to refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest wherein they will note uh, that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I do hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I am not currently practising. Presiding officer, Amendment 34 in the name of Margaret Mitchell would put on the face of the bill certain requirements for a success fee agreement to be enforceable. I would ask Parliament to reject this amendment as it undermines the principle of an independently regulated legal profession. At the same time, the provisions as proposed in this amendment are unnecessary, and I will deal with that second issue in a moment. But turning to the first point, this amendment would mean that substantial provisions about solicitors' professional obligations would be fixed in primary legislation rather than in law society rules, which are, aside from any other consideration, uh, much more flexible in terms of updating and so forth. The amendment therefore appears to strike at the heart of an independent law society and does not take any account of the principle that professional rules are best made by a professional body. Chair Principal Taylor has commented that he believes that the second part of this amendment in particular is impractical uh, and taking into account the fact that, as Daniel Johnson uh, mentioned, a number of cases still settle at the 11th hour at the door of the court. Chair Principal Taylor believes that in particular subparagraphs one and two would be difficult to comply with. 
and points out that the solicitor is already under an obligation to comply with the provisions which the amendment calls to be certified in subparagraphs 3 and 4. If these provisions are inserted into primary legislation, there is also a question of who is going to be responsible to regulate them as it stands. It is not clear from the amendment that, it is, uh, or, or that the Law Society would have that responsibility and therefore that is a matter of uh, uncertainty as well. Presiding officer, it's a fundamental principle of maintaining an independent legal profession that there is no state interference or influence exerted. The Scottish Government is committed to the principle of an independent profession and I would ask the Parliament to support that principle. It is, I am sure, well known that Scottish uh, solicitors, uh, as said, are already required to act in the best interests of their clients at all times and must ensure their clients understand feeing arrangements and give informed consent. Success fee uh, agreements are not new. Indeed, they have been in place uh, in some form since the 1990s and any theoretical conflicts and other issues have not prevented, uh, uh, in the case of speculative fee agreements, these agreements being rolled out since that time. Uh, and where the provider of relevant services is a claims management company, of course, it will fall under the uh, uh, regulation of the Financial Conduct Authority. Finally, presiding officer, I would wish to mention uh, that the Law Society has, in fact, set up a working party which is currently looking at success fee agreements and what provisions should be made in Law Society rules and guidance to govern, govern their terms and any other uh, relevant issues. What I can say to Margaret Mitchell, because I understand what is motivating uh, the, 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 the uh, amendment she has put forward, so I do undertake to write to the Law Society to draw their attention to the points that Margaret Mitchell's amendment raised. Uh, and of course, the Scottish Government will work with the Law Society as the bill is implemented to seek to ensure that the provisions relating to success fees are implemented in a way which best gives effect to the principles of the bill. In summary, uh, presiding officer, Amendment 34 provides for matters that should not be set out in primary legislation, which risk undermining the principle of an independently regulated legal profession and which are more appropriately handled in rules and guidance provided by the Law Society of Scotland in its capacity as regulator of solicitors. Hence, I would ask Margaret Mitchell to consider withdrawing Amendment 34. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Margaret Mitchell to wind up and press or withdraw her amendment. Uh, thank you, Deputy Providing officers. There have been a number of points uh, raised here. Daniel Johnson raised the point um, that it might prohibit at door court settlements, but there's nothing really to distort a, a pro forma, written pro forma, being available that the client can set there. And um, that would only be strengthened against the background of this amendment being passed. And in, ten, in terms of ensuring um, the, the pursuer is has um, taken the decision with fully informed choice. I think that really does outweigh anything that might be looked to be cumbersome because let's not forget that um, as it was argued during stage one and two, um, it's, these, these, um, these losses are for very often complex needs, essential care. And if these are being written into, and it's not as if the lawyers don't um, have another way of being re remunerated, then it could have indeed very adverse effects for the pursuer in uh, an injury claim. And whilst all lawyers have a duty to act in good faith and in the objective interests of their clients, sadly this isn't uh, always the case. So I believe it's now important, rather than waiting sometime in the future to see what the Law Society may or may not come up with in terms of success fee agreements, um, to put on the face of the bill the protection which um, Amendment 34 would provide. And I move. You've got to press it now. You've moved it already. I press it. <laughs> the question is, Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. As this is the first division of the stage, the Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Thank you. We'll now proceed with the division on Amendment 34. This is a 30-second division. Members should cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the division on Amendment 34 is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 84. There are no abstentions. That amendment is therefore not agreed. And now we move on to um, Group 2, Amendment 5, in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendments 6, 7, 8, 13 and 14. Minister, please, to move Amendment 5 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendments 5 to 8 are technical uh, in nature. Uh, we have been working with Her Majesty's Treasury on the UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, which will now regulate claims management companies in Scotland. The Treasury envisages success fee caps being imposed by professional rules. These will be rules of the Financial Conduct Authority in the case of claims management companies or rules of a legal services regulator in the case of solicitors. It is thought at present that there is little likelihood that success fee caps and professional rules and success fee caps under Section 4 of this bill will interact. Success fee caps in professional rules could, however, interact with success fee caps uh, under uh, Section 4 if uh, the Westminster Secondary legislation on claims management companies changes at some point in the future. In addition, the current legal services review uh, that the Scottish Government has instructed could lead to changes in legal profession regulation that change the extent or nature of professional rules applied to solicitors. Therefore, presiding officer, what we are seeking in effect to do here is to provide uh, future proofing. Specifically, the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, which is to be amended by the UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill in order to regulate claims management companies, will allow the Treasury to make regulations to give power to the FCA to make professional rules. Such rules would be tertiary legislation. Amendments 5 to 8 uh, 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 amend uh, section 4, subsection 3, subsection B and subsection 4 of the Civil Litigation Bill to ensure that success fee caps made in professional rules in accordance with an enactment will be treated the same as success fee caps made in an enactment. The policy in section 4 has always been that where there are two uh, sets of fee caps, it is the lower one that has effect. The amendments reflect that a fee cap in professional rules might not count as a fee, a fee cap in an enactment and therefore the relevant text will become by or accord in accordance with an enactment. And to reiterate, Presiding Officer, we do not expect the Westminster fee caps as currently proposed by the Treasury to interact with uh, those to be provided further to this bill. Uh, amendments 13 and 14 uh, are also uh, technical uh, drafting amendments. Amendment 13 combines subsections 2B and 3A of section 10 into one subsection, which indicates the circumstances where subsection 2A does not apply. Thus, there will be a single subsection providing that the providers of success fee agreements and trade unions and staff associations will not be at risk of an award of expenses. Amendment 14 is another technical drafting amendment that ensures that the first reference to the Lord President of the Court of Session in section 13A of the bill uses the Lord President's full title. The Lord President's full title is already used in section 93. Since both amendments are minor and technical, they do not make any substantive changes to sections 10 and section 13A. I move uh, amendment 5, presiding officer. Uh, no member has indicated the wish to speak. Minister, do you wish to wind up? No. Thank you. The question is amendment 5, we agree to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call amendment 6, 7 and 8, all in the name of the minister and all previous debate of amendment 5. And invite the minister to move the amendments 6 to 8 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question? We put on amendments 6 to 8. No one. Uh, uh, the question is that amendments 6 to 8 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, group 3, I call amendment 1 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Group with amendments 2, 2A, 3 and 4. Daniel Johnson, please, to move amendment 1 and speak to the other amendments in the group.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 1 and will speak to Amendments 1 to 4 in my name and against Margaret Mitchell's uh, Amendment 2A. And apologies in advance, Presiding Officers. These are complex amendments and may take some time to rehearse the arguments and issues. I would also like to declare an interest as a proud trade unionist and a member of community and USDAW trade unions. And I have also worked uh, with the STUC and, and uh, lawyers that work with them uh, who work on personal injury cases uh, with regard to these amendments. Ultimately, the decisions this Parliament makes on this bill are around access to justice. And on each amendment, we should ask ourselves one clear question, set one clear test as we vote, which is this. Does voting for the amendment increase access to justice or reduce it? And indeed, that is precisely what is at the heart of Sheriff Principal James Taylor's uh, uh, proposals and at the heart of this bill. But furthermore, we must ask ourselves, does it make it more or less likely that a claimant who has been wronged will get the justice they deserve? And importantly, where damages are awarded, does it make it uh, more or less likely they'll get the true value of their claim? Now, the Justice Committee at Stage 2 decided to accept amendments from Margaret Mitchells. My amendments today seek to reserve, reverse that decision, and I'd like to explain why. The issue at hand is whether success fee agreements known as damages-based agreements and best known as no-win, no-fee are allowed to include any proportion of future losses in the fee for the lawyer. On the face of it, as I'm sure Margaret Mitchell will argue, that does seem unfair. The argument goes that lawyers shouldn't receive a single penny of the damages awarded for the cost of catastrophic injury. However, we must return to that test. Does this actually increase access to justice. Sheriff Principal Taylor, the architect of this legislation, as the author of the report which led to this bill, wrote to the committee, and in a, a surprising and extraordinary move in many ways, and set out in the starkest possible terms his view of the bill as it was amended at stage two. He wrote that the amended bill uh, posed an existential threat to damages-based agreements being offered in higher value cases in Scotland. In other words, if you ring fence future losses, lawyers are simply not incentivized to offer no win, no fee agreements for those higher value cases. Sheriff Principal Taylor's report had to strike a balance, a carefully constructed balance, to ensure that lawyers would actually offer no win, no fee agreements to those who have suffered catastrophic injuries. To do that, he allows lawyers to include a small and importantly capped percentage of damages. This means that lawyers will be incentivized not just to pursue catastrophic cases, but also to ensure they are settled for the maximum possible value. In other words, the interests of the client and the lawyer are perfectly aligned. So what if we don't reverse the amendments that were put through at stage two? What would the impact be? Sheriff Principal Taylor is very clear. The likely outcome is that cases will either not be raised at all or will settle for considerably less than the true value of the claim. And that's a direct quote. Furthermore, the Law Society agrees, and again, to quote them, to ring fence future losses from the calculation of a success fee may mean that success fee agreements will not be offered in the higher value cases as it's simply, uh, it is simply not economic to do so, and the public at large will be the poorer. The reason we can be so sure about this is that in England and Wales, a recent change along these lines has led exactly to the situation as outlined uh, 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 by uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor and the Law Society. No win, no fee agreements are simply not used to fund personal injury actions and thus access to justice has been greatly diminished. Furthermore, ring fencing future losses could lead to past losses and future losses being treated very differently in the courts leading to two unintended consequences. Those with existing losses, losses already incurred, would have more opportunity to bring forward litigation uh, than those who uh, have suffered future losses due to the greater availability of success fee agreements. That feels inconsistent and unfair. Furthermore, it could incentivize the delaying of action so that past losses are actually incurred rather than being future losses at the point that court action is carried forward. And so to Margaret Mitchell's Amendment 2A. Firstly, and most fundamentally, they are based on an assumption that the court fees awarded to lawyers are sufficient. At present, the fees that lawyers receive for cases are simply not enough to cover their costs. If they were, no one would be going down the current damages-based agreement route. But they do, 
and they do so in very large numbers. And they do so on the basis of, uh, of uh, lawyers taking 20 to 35% cuts of the total damages amount. This bill gives ministers the ability to regulate the allowable deductions that lawyers can make as part of the agreement. Ta Sheriff Principal James Taylor has recommended a sliding scale, 20% on the first £100,000, down to 2.5% on damages over £500,000. This represents a reduction on the current situation. But crucially, ministers are able to alter these scales by regulation, so that if it does uh, come to pass that there are unintended consequences, that lawyers are taking disproportionate sums from awards, that that can be modified. But most critically, I believe that Margaret Mitchell's amendment makes a, a crucial error in terms of the way it is drafted, because it simply does not allow for this flexibility. Instead, it hard codes figures regarding the proportion and the value onto the face of the bill, removing the flexibility and the ability to make uh, different decisions in the future. And unfortunately, these figures, which Margaret Mitchell has chosen, do not come from Taylor's carefully balanced proposals. Rather, they come from the insurance industry's own briefing papers. Now, while I perfectly understand the insurance industry's right, indeed, it is only uh, right that they pursue their own interests and the interests of their industry, we must take a much broader view in terms of the interests of this legislation. Because clearly, it is in the in insurance industry's interest to reduce the number of cases brought and to reduce the value of the final claims settled rather than increasing those things, which fails my critical test set out at the beginning. So finally, this group is not a minor point in this bill. Taylor, the architect of this legislation, legislation says that if we don't reverse the amendments that made at stage two, by, by passing amendments uh, one to four, the bill will, and I quote, make access to justice less accessible to the man in the street than if he or she had not reported. That is a stark warning indeed. So I urge you to vote for the amendments one to four in my name and against amendment 2A. Thank you, presiding officer. Please move amendment one. I, I move amendment one through four. In no, my name. just one. Just one. Just the one. Apologies. Thank you. Can I ask Margaret Mitchell now to speak to Amendment 2A and other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendment 2A amends Amendment 2 lodged by Daniel Johnson, the effect of which is to remove the ring fencing of future loss approved by the Justice Committee at Stage 2. I therefore lodge this amendment in the event of Amendment 2 being passed in an attempt to mitigate the potential adverse consequences of future care costs lost to lawyers' fees. This is because under the terms of the bill as introduced, a success fee agreement can include damages-based award as a part of the solicitor's fee, and this can include past and future loss. In recognition of the importance of protecting future loss and the associated care and support for injured pursuers, the Justice Committee amended the bill at stage two and ring-fenced future loss. That was supported by the, the European Court of Human Rights as well as those representatives of um, pers uh, the, uh, the insurance industry. However, Sheriff Principal, Ta uh, Principal Taylor subs subsequently wrote to the committee to express his opposition to this decision and set out reasons why, reasons that Daniel Johnson has accepted in lodging this amendment. In support of this view, Sheriff Principal Taylor stated that in England and Wales, the effect of ring fencing future loss on DBAs was that lawyers won't enter into a DBA. But in doing so, he's not taken into account that in Scotland, unlike England and Wales, lawyers enter into DBAs and can, in addition to these damages-based agreements, also claim judicial expenses and potentially an additional fee which recognise, right, recognises the complex nature of the cases that can take many years to conclude. This additional fee or uplift can amount to three or four times the original award for judicial expenses. So in effect, Daniel Johnson. Would she recognise that the awarding of additional fees, such as she set out and such as she's pinning such a great deal of store by, are only awarded in 5% of cases? Is that really sufficient grounds to 
rest her argument on. Margaret Mitchell. We're looking at a new set of legislation here where it's clearly set out that these are very complex cases and the awards amounts we're talking about refer to these specific cases. Now, I rather think the, the percentages you, you're quoting um, do not reflect uh, the amount of judicial expenses that recognise the complexity of the case. Um, the point of amendment to a therefore is to try and mitigate the amount a solicitor can claim from their client's award as part of their fee. To recap, if future loss remains ring fence, there's no question of an injured pursuer's future care loss being eroded as part of a solicitor's fee. However, if Daniel Johnson's amendment passes, only awards over one million will be the subject to conditions set out in the bill. There is no provision on the face of the bill for the amount of damages that lawyers can claim as the Scottish Government has left the determination of these amount to regulations. Amendment 2A therefore seeks to cap the amount of success fee claimed in damages based agreements to 1% of any amount awarded over £500,000, which is the kind of sums that tend to be involved in complex personal injury cases. Presiding officer, I consider one of the least persuasive arguments Sheriff Principal Taylor and Daniel Johnson deploy in opposing ring fencing of future loss is that this may lead to unscrupulous lawyers delaying cases in order to increase the past loss amount from which they can take their fee. Surely we shouldn't be regulating to look at a small minority of people that do not reflect the practice of the um, Law Society's members. And surely the whole point of this bill, which uh, seeks to increase access, is that it seeks to increase access to justice for an injured pursuer and make sure that they do receive the, the support for a care passage they need for future loss. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur and I'll take John Finney after that. Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's difficult to admit uh, you got it wrong, but I think that is exactly what the committee did, all of us, um, at stage uh, two. I think they're mitigating circumstances. Undoubtedly, the issue that uh, we're discussing, as um, Daniel Johnson intimated in his opening remarks, was one of the most um, sensitive uh, that we had to wrestle with uh, during the course of our scrutiny of the bill, which is, after all, about increasing access to justice. And increasing access to justice uh, for those who've been most grievously harmed or most grievously wrong uh, carried a, a particular significance. But uh, ring-fencing future losses, as happens in England and Wales, and as uh, we voted to support at stage two, uh, although motivated, I think, um, still by the best of intentions, um, I, I think I'm now convinced it would have perverse consequences that were fairly graphically set out by Sheriff Principal Taylor in his letter to the committee post stage two. Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended damages for future loss uh, included in success fees if and only if the future element is to be paid in a lump sum. If future element is to be paid by periodical payment, uh, then those damages are not uh, to be included. And I was struck going back over the, um, the, the official report of stage two by something the minister uh, said when she, she pointed to the change to the discount interest rate and the provisions in the uh, damages bill and said it seems to be much more likely that in future the element of damages payment relating to future loss will be made by means of a periodical payment order. I think it's also worth bearing in mind that if the future element is more than a million pounds, then the court will have to do, uh, agree that it's in, in the client's best interest for that to be paid in a lump sum. And if it's in, agreed by settlement, an actuary would be involved in that decision as well. There is no getting away from the fact that DBAs have proved themselves popular, even uh, where success fees of anything up to 60% are being charged. As, the, uh, as, as Sheriff Principal Taylor pointed out, um, the, the, the amended uh, bill as it stands without the amendments brought forward by Daniel Johnson pose a potential ex existential threat to DBAs and surely it would be better uh, to cap those at 2.5% uh, as is uh, proposed. It's, as I say, not easy to admit you got it wrong. I've had the 
uh, experience of speaking against uh, an amendment I had lodged, so there are degrees of discomfort uh, in this regard. Uh, but I do believe that ring fencing future losses may indeed work against the interests of the very people uh, we're seeking to pr uh, protect and provide access to justice for. And for that reason, uh, we on these benches will be supporting amendments one to three uh, proposed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Finney, then I'll take Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I would align myself with the comments of my colleagues Daniel Johnson and, and uh, Liam MacArthur. Um, and indeed, I am prepared to say, yeah, it's, it's important that we constantly reflect, and certainly Sheriff Taylor's letter caused me to reflect. He's the architect of this legislation, and a recurring phrase I don't doubt you're going to hear today and in the future debate is access to justice. And to me, this is uh, at the core of it. And it may very well seem entirely counterintuitive when you hear phrases like loss to lawyers, please, to see hard fought for uh, awards uh, go in that way. But I want to just mention two phrases that Daniel Johnson said, and that is the mutual interest. And I think it's, it is that joint interest of working together between the client and, and the lawyer that's important. And, and also to, to point out, as Daniel Johnson did, about the role of regulation for allowable deductions. I think that's important too. But the most important thing, I think, is if the purpose of this legislation is to increase access to justice, then the phrase that Sheriff Taylor used, not raised at all, is something we want to avoid. So I would encourage members to support Daniel Johnson and oppose Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Liam Kerr. And officer, I rise to speak against amendments one and two, but in favour of amendment 2A. If amendment two is passed and confirmed, we will vote for amendments three and four. At the outset, let me declare I am a practising solicitor and I hold practising certificates with both the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland. Amendments one and two in the name of Daniel Johnson seek to allow <laughs> pursuer solicitors to take an element of the claimant's damages for future loss when calculating their success fee. The amendment to ring fence damages for future loss to exclude them when calculating the success fee was introduced at stage two. It was unopposed at the time. Now, I believe the ring fencing of damages for future loss is the right thing to do. Where someone has been injured, damages for future loss are paid to put them back in the financial position they would have been in had they not been injured, but also, <coughs> crucially, to fund the costs of care and support. A need has been identified and a sum has been awarded to cover it. And I cannot see that it is right to reduce any element of that and thus potentially prejudice the amount available to the pursuer for their future care and support in order to reward and incentivise pursuer solicitors. Yes, Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson. So just on, on that very point, would you not recognise that, that the, 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 the proportions currently being awarded as much as 60% as Liam MacArthur pointed out and indeed, his, his argument would only ring true if judges' awards were 100% accurate. But I don't believe any judge's award assessment of future losses was accurate to within 2.5%, unless you can correct me on that point. Liam Kerr. Well, I think the important point, just before I deal with that, because I will come back onto that, I, I just want to take a point that Daniel Johnson made earlier, um, because he criticised the insurance industry for allegedly wishing to reduce claims. But then in the same breath, he lionised, without caveat, the words of those lawyers who wish to ensure that their fees are enhanced. And I just, perhaps in closing, Daniel would like to address that. Uh, but look, I speculated, in terms of the level of the award, I speculated with various witnesses in the committee that it is difficult to see why a court wouldn't, over time, as I believed has happened elsewhere, gently and perhaps understandably increase the award to ensure the full costs of care are recovered after the solicitors have taken their fee, leading to a damages inflation or even overcompensation. <laughs> Minister. <laughs> Minister. I just wonder what evidence the member will be able to cite to support the, that claim that he's just made. I mean, obviously, he'll be aware that that has been refuted by, for example, Apple, the Association of Personal Injuries Lawyers. Liam Kerr. Quite so, but in committee, uh, we had various evidence that suggested that there was a possibility of that, and in other jurisdictions, that had happened. So I accept that there is differing evidence, but I think, as I pressed on various witnesses during the committee, I think it is possible. And I think the logical progression is that we could see that happening, based indeed on the point that Daniel Johnson made earlier. So I think the committee was right to ring fence future losses at stage two. Uh, and we will oppose Daniel Johnson's amendments one and two to ensure that people are not being undercompensated for their future care. That having been said, if Parliament is not with me on that, I do urge support for Amendment 2A in the name of Margaret Mitchell to cap success fee applied to future losses at 1% in order that those who receive future losses to provide for their care retain as much of their award as possible. Thank you. 
Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to support Daniel Johnson's amendments 1, 2, 3 and 4. The bill was introduced following Chair Principal Taylor's recommendation that an award for future loss in personal injury success fee agreements should not be ring-fenced. In other words, future loss should not be excluded uh, from the calculation of a success fee in cases taken forward under a success fee agreement in circumstances where the future loss element is to be paid as a lump sum. And that is not uh, the position, of course, where the future loss element is to be paid by way of a periodical payment uh, order, as we have heard. In such circumstances, ring fencing will uh, indeed uh, apply. Considerable concern was expressed in the Justice Committee Stage 1 report that those unfortunate claimants with catastrophic injuries would not receive the full amount awarded by the court if the part of their damages attributable to future loss was included in the calculation of the success fee to be paid to the legal representatives. And that point has been made uh, uh, already this afternoon. Margaret Mitchell's Stage 2 amendments provided that the future element in any award for personal injury be excluded from any uplift by a legal services provider in a success fee agreement irrespective of whether it was to be paid by way of a lump sum or by way of a periodical payment order. Uh, Presiding officer, I too supported the amendment at that time on the basis that we believed that this amendment would, as a matter of practice, affect very few cases and that these cases would mainly involve claims relating to catastrophic injuries uh, uh, and no other particular uh, uh, cases. Since stage two, however, the Scottish Government has been in discussions with Share Principal Taylor, the Law Society of Scotland and the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. We've also received submissions from other bodies. Two important considerations have come to light. First, we now believe that the stage two amendments relating to ring fencing future loss in all circumstances might have the unintended uh, effect of restricting access to justice. Whereas the Scottish Government believe that awards for future loss only affected a very a few high value cases, we are now informed that this is not the case. The Law Society has indicated that even low value cases of, for example, some £3,000 may contain a future element to the award of settlement. The future loss element of a claim is often complicated and involves a solicitor in a considerable amount of work. As the Law Society put it in its letter to the Justice Committee of 14th March, the calculation of future loss is often the most complex and time consuming aspect of a personal injury claim. If the solicitor is una unable to be remunerated for that work through a success fee agreement, then he or she might not be able to offer damages-based agreements for personal injury cases. Chair Principal Taylor confirmed that this was a possibility in his letter to me of 8 March, which was also copied to the Justice Committee. In that letter, he defended his decision not to exclude all future loss from the calculation of a success fee, but rather to impose such an exclusion where it was to be paid uh, the settlement for future loss was to be paid by way of periodical payment order. Share Principal, stated, Principal Taylor stated, and I quote, if I did not permit a sufficient percentage deduction, solicitors would not offer damages-based agreements as a funding mechanism. They would not recover sufficient in the successful cases to compensate for the unsuccessful cases. One has to remember that should a case be unsuccessful, not only does the solicitor not get paid for his or her own time, but the firm must also meet court dues expert witness fees, medical reports, and other items out of the solicitor's own pocket. This is Chair Principal Taylor saying, I had to create an environment in which damages-based agreements were sufficiently attractive to solicitors, but still fair to the injured pursuer. The amended provision on future loss may therefore represent a severe restriction of access to justice and negate some of the principles upon which this bill is founded. It is thought that the failure of damages-based agreements to take off in England and Wales is in fact as a result of future loss being completely ring-fenced south of the border and thus unattractive uh, to legal uh, practitioners. And I do not believe we should make the same mistake here. I heard uh, Margaret Mitchell's comments about the issue of judicial expenses and the differing approach to that north and south of the border. But of course, we also heard evidence to the effect indeed from Sheriff Principal Taylor himself, that Lord Justice Jackson, who conducted a similar review south of the border, actually, whilst he promoted the position that Margaret Mitchell was supporting today, has now got cold feet because it has led to solicitors south of the border and in Wales not offering damages-based agreements for personal injury actions. The other point I wish to make, presiding officer, was the issue of the unintentional consequence of ring fencing of future loss uh, for those with catastrophic uh, injuries and who may, uh, uh, paradoxically, as a result of this uh, approach that uh, had been put forward uh, at stage two, in fact, receive lower awards and settlements. In other words, stage two amendments intended to maximise pursuer compensation 
could in practice have the opposite uh, effect. As I stated earlier, the future loss element of a claim is often complicated and involves the solicitor in a considerable amount of work. I am informed it's not uncommon for a solicitor outlays to be in the region of £100,000 over perhaps a three-year period in such cases. Chair Principal Taylor recommended in his report that lump sum damages for future loss should be included in the calculation of the success fee under a success fee agreement because solicitors need to be incentivised. He recommended, as Liam MacArthur rightly said, safeguards which are set forth in the bill as it was uh, introduced and uh, uh, also Chair Principal Taylor recommended that future loss damages would not be included, as I've said, if they were to be paid by way of periodical payment orders. Only a small number of cases end up before a court and the vast majority are settled out of court. Discussions with personal injury solicitors have revealed that solicitor-led cases result in higher settlements as defenders try to avoid the expense of a court hearing. In other words, having a solicitor is likely to result in the claimant receiving greater damages, possibly much greater damages. Chair Taylor, uh, certainly. Liam Kerr. Just very briefly, in those conversations with those solicitors' terms, did many of them report back that if uh, the future loss was ring-fenced, they would cease to act in personal injury claims? Minister. Uh, well, I, I think we have to uh, look at the, the facts before us and listen to the uh, evidence that has been uh, submitted to myself as Minister, to uh, the committee as well, where people are telling us that there is a very significant risk. Uh, if we look already at what has happened south of the border, uh, in light of the similar approach being pursued there, uh, an approach promoted by Lord Justice Jackson, which Sheriff Principal Taylor says that in a conversation that Lord Justice Jackson had with Sheriff Principal Taylor, Lord Justice Jackson now has cold feet because uh, they are in a position that is the opposite of what he had hoped the position would be in terms of solicitors operating damages-based agreements. Margaret Mitchell. The Wales is not analogous with the situation in Scotland. So we're not only comparing apples and apples. Minister. I've already, I think, to be fair, presiding officer, dealt with that point, whereas notwithstanding the issue about judicial expenses, nonetheless, the architect of the policy south of the border has, to Sheriff Principal Taylor, in effect, recanted because it has had the opposite effect, such that solicitors in England and Wales are not offering damages-based agreements. What this bill is designed to do, which has been mentioned by Daniel Johnson, by John Finney, by Liam MacArthur, it is designed to do the very opposite. It is designed to improve access to justice as far as civil litigation in Scotland is concerned. Chair Principal Taylor uh, said in the letter to which I have already alluded, and I quote, My concern is that the recent amendment to the bill will have the same consequence in high-value cases in Scotland as has happened in England and Wales. Damages-based agreements will not be offered to pursuers who have sustained catastrophic injury. The recent amendment thus poses an existential threat, as Liam MacArthur mentioned, to damages-based agreements being offered in high-value cases in Scotland. What will be the consequence of the amendment? The likely outcome is that cases will either not be raised at all or will settle, or will settle, and perhaps that helps to deal with uh, uh, Mr Kerr's point, or will settle for considerably less than the true value of the claim. Finally, the Law Society letter to the Justice Committee reiterates two practical issues which Sheriff Principal Taylor raised in his report. The first relates to settlement offers. At present, uh, most of these are put forward by insurers without there being any breakdown for the different heads of claim, meaning that past loss and future loss are not broken down and separated uh, when uh, an offer is made. The second practical interest is that as a legal services provider will be paid for past loss work and not for future loss, an obvious conflict of interest will be created as between the solicitor and the client. Yeah. Margaret Mitchell. Establishing what the future loss element is, does she accept that insurance companies are doing that every day and they've confirmed that um, this would not be a difficulty if it was required? Well, Minister. I, 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 thank you, Presiding Officer. With respect, I mean, I did see, I think, a, a, a submission from one of the uh, representatives of the insurance industry, and it's really, you know, it's a matter for the, the pursuer acting on the advice of his or her legal advisor to uh, decide what is best for that pursuer. And it's not really a matter for the insurance company, which has an entirely different interest and conflicting interest in the matter to have a role in that very important uh, uh, client uh, uh, legal advisor uh, relationship. 
Um, so I would say, presiding officer, that without Daniel Johnson's amendments today, the solicitor uh, could have uh, a financial interest, interest in apportioning as much as possible to the past law element rather than to uh, the future element, even a solicitor acting in good faith, and, and we hope that that is the case with regard to all solicitors, would have to deal with this uh, important conflict. I have, presiding officer, considered these matters long and hard since stage two, as has Daniel Johnson, John Finney and Liam MacArthur. And for the reasons I have stated, uh, I am now persuaded that it is the right position that we see the reintroduction into the bill uh, as per Daniel Johnson's amendments. And also, I, I'm not able to support uh, Margaret Mitchell's amendment uh, 2A. I mean no criticism of Margaret Mitchell, since I know, as I said uh, in the first grouping, that her amendments are motivated by the aim of maximising pursuer compensation. But the balance of evidence on the matter submitted following stage two is, uh, in my view, uh, compelling. The bill has the objective, as I said, of increasing access to justice and civil litigation. Its goals are to make the cost of litigating more affordable and more predictable to the citizens of Scotland. I am now convinced that the bill as originally drafted better serves those objectives and goals and that Margaret Mitchell's amendment, though well-intentioned, will not in fact result in enhanced access to justice, rather uh, the reverse. Uh, at stage two, for understandable reasons, we focused on those who have suffered catastrophic injury, receiving all the monies awarded to them by a court. I am now persuaded that by allowing the solicitor to take a small percentage, and that is important to point out, it would be for sums over £500,000, 2.5%. At the present time, an example could be uh, where a claims management company might charge, say, £33,000. So an award of damages of £1 million at the moment, uh, the sum of £330,000 is being awarded in terms of the success fee. Under the sliding cap proposed in this bill, in this carefully crafted package of interlinking provisions, the amount of damages on the sum, same sum of £1 million will be £72,500. Presiding officer, ring fencing all future loss may result in very few uh, personal injury claims of any value being taken forward under success fee agreements, which will restrict access to justice. Put it plainly, surely it is better to have 97.5% of something rather than 100% percent of nothing. I therefore support Daniel Johnson's amendments. On Margaret Mitchell's amendment, I think I have explained why uh, it is the case that it would not seek to maximise the uh, amount available to the pursuer, particularly in cases of catastrophic uh, loss. Uh, and also, uh, they are, uh, it is the case that has been referred to that there is provision in the bill to ensure that by regulations to be dealt with by affirmative procedure before this parliament, that any changes to the figures in the sliding cap of fees proposed would be dealt with in accordance with uh, affirmative regulations. Uh, and therefore, presiding officer, uh, I, m I support uh, Daniel Johnson's amendments one, two, three, and four, and I do not support Margaret Mitchell's amendment number 2A. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Johnson. To wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. I, I think the fundamental points regarding these amendments were, were best made by John Finney and by Liam MacArthur. John Finney said that fundamentally what this is about is making sure that solicitors' interests and those of the people on, on whose behalf they are making claims are, are aligned. And I think that by making sure that, that where there are no such, there are no caps, and there's no limitations uh, in, in that regard, that they are interests are perfectly aligned because otherwise there will be a clear incentive if there's a cap for solicitors to settle early. Likewise, I think Liam MacArthur is absolutely right that we must recognise current practice and DBAs are very popular. What's more, it's not 2.5% of the awards that, that, that are being claimed by those who are representing claimants, it's as much as 60% with a typical figure being 30%. So this bill will reduce that. It will introduce a sliding scale of from 20 to to 2.5%. More cases and more of the damages going to clients. So while I very much understand the motivations behind Margaret Mitchell's amendments, the desire to give the fullest possible amount to, to clients, the reality is, is that under her amendments, clients will have fewer opportunities to take their case forward and limit their access to justice. Now, Liam Kerr suggested that I was criticising the insurance industry. I was doing no such thing. What I was saying 
was that we must recognise that the arguments made by the insurance industry are legitimate arguments and they are right to pursue the interests of their industry. But those arguments, as the Minister alluded to, run contrary to the interests of, of clients because it is in the insurance industry's interest to reduce the number of claims brought forward and to reduce the amounts that are settled upon. So my criticism isn't of the insurance industry, my criticism is of those who copy and repeat those arguments without qualification and without criticism because I think they ignore the wider public interest in favour of corporate interest and I don't think that is acceptable because ultimately we must return to the clear test. We must return to the test, does this a proposal, do these amendments increase access to justice? Do these amendments allow more people to take forward claims and achieve the highest possible value? My amendments do exactly that. And unfortunately, I feel Margaret Mitchells fail that test. Sheriff Principal James Taylor has come forward with a balanced and well thought through set of proposals, and we should stick to those. The amendments, uh, in his own words, that were laid down in, in, in stage two, would reduce access to justice and make it less accessible. So my amendments are, are required to effectively save this bill from the misguided attempts to qualify uh, and, and put safeguards uh, into it. And I urge Parliament to support my amendments and reject Margaret Mitchell's 2A. I press uh, the amendments. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed there'll be a division. It's a 60-second division. Members should cast their votes now. Thank you. They voted yes, 86, no, 29. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment two in the name of Daniel Johnson, ready to read from amendment one. Mr Johnson, move or not move? Move. I call amendment 2A in the name of Margaret Mitchell, ready to read from amendment one. Ms Mitchell, move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 2A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Members should cast their votes now. They voted yes, 29, no, 86, or no abstentions. That amendment is therefore not agreed. Daniel Johnson to press or withdraw amendment two. Uh, press. The question is amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. It's another 30 second division. Members should cast their votes now. Amendment 2, the voted yes, 86, no, 29. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 3 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Already agreed to Amendment 1. Mr Johnson, move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are agreed. Call Amendment 4 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Already debated Amendment 1. Mr Johnson, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We now move on to Group 4. Power to modify Section 7. Oh. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Daniel Johnson and a group on its own. Mr Johnson to move and speak to Amendment 35. Um, I move Amendment 35 in my name. This is an amendment that was suggested by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, at stage two, this was amended by the government to reduce the power of ministers so that they could not, by regulation, modify any part of, uh, uh, of, of the part on success fee agreements. This was changed to limit it so that uh, to just allow ministers to change by regulations anything in section seven. That has the odd effect of being able to add by regulations the kind of things that ministers could regulate on, which is circular. In the words of the DPLR committee, that this is an unusual power and very wide in scope. Um, it is not one uh, they recommend as being necessary. I therefore move Amendment 35 in my name to bring effect to the committee's recommendation and hope that Parliament will agree with it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister to speak to the amendments in this group. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee report on the Bill at Stage 1 expressed, indeed, concern about the breadth of the power given to Scottish Ministers by Section 7, Subsection 4, to modify Part 1 of the Bill. The Government brought forward an amendment at Stage 2 which responded to these concerns by restricting the power so that it would apply to just Section 7 rather than Part 1 of the Bill as a whole. The amendment also restricted the power so that the regulations could be added to Section 7 or modified text added by the regulations but not otherwise alter it. In other words, none of the text of Section 7 that the Parliament agrees to at Stage 3 may be removed by regulations. Furthermore, the delegated power proposed cannot as it has been suggested, be used to modify itself. That goes against basic principles of administrative law. As the government explained in its response to the DPLRC, the purpose of Section 7, Subsection 3 and 4 is to augment the current provisions of the Bill in relation to success fee agreements where it is considered to be desirable to have future provision about the mandatory terms of success fee agreements or their enforcement. Such a provision, however, would only be brought forward after consultation on the regulation of success fee agreements with stakeholders and thus cannot be included in the bill at this stage. The regulations would mean that any new provisions could be set out in section 7 rather than set out in freestanding regulations. That would mean that all of the mandatory terms relating to success fee agreements would be found in the primary legislation. The DPLRC in its further report has stated that it, it continues to be concerned that subsection 4 as amended at stage 2 continues to be wide in scope. The government uh, presiding officer continues to believe however that the power in section 7 subsection 4 would be beneficial and would permit all the relevant provisions as I said on success fee agreements to sit together in primary legislation rather than have them sit separately in regulations. For that reason I would ask Daniel Johnson to consider withdrawing the amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And no one else wishes to speak. I call on Daniel Johnson to wind up to press or withdraw. Uh, thank you very much, Providing Officer. As the, the Minister said herself, the, the DPLRC have said that subsection 4 is, and I quote, very wide in scope. The very purpose of the DPLR committee is to act as a safeguard, a check on the power of the executive. I think, therefore, it would be odd, if not Indeed, I would suggest outrageous for the government not to heed those warnings. They are there specifically to, to, uh, to prevent these sorts of overreach of power. Therefore, I think we should uh, uh, listen to them, uh, and I will uh, continue to, to press my amendment. Thank you very much. In that case, we will go straight to the question. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. This is a one-minute division. And the question is that Amendment 35 be agreed. One minute.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 35 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 52, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now that brings us to the end of that particular group and members may have noted that we have actually passed the agreed time limit for the debate in this group to finish. Um, I exercise my power under Rule 9.8.4 AC to allow debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being cur unreasonably curtailed. We move on now to Group 5 and I call Amendment 9 in the name of John Finney grouped with amendments 9a, 10, 11 and 12, and I would point out that if amendment 9 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments 10 and 11. They will be preempted. John Finney to move amendment 9 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Sheriff Taylor's report was long awaited, um, and um, there's significant changes in law, and the, the purpose was to bring a level playing field in respect of personal injury litigation. And that's because Sheriff Taylor recognised something that's very important, that that was the balance of power had gone too far in favour of the insurance companies. Um, and the solution was qualified one-way cost shifting. Now, that's not a phrase we've heard much today. I think we'll hear some more about quarks, as it was shortened to. And that was a restriction on the pursuer's liability for expenses and personal injury claims. If the test for when people benefit from quarks, and most importantly lose the benefit of quarks, is flawed, then the intention of the bill will be frustrated. My amendment seeks to address that flaw because for quarks to be effective, leg legislation must ensure two issues, certainty and that a sufficiently high bar is set. Claimants and those financially supporting claimants, such as trade unions and staff associations, must be able to bring difficult but meritorious cases without fear of financial ruin if the case is lost. If there's not a high degree of certainty about the cases that will benefit from quarks and those that will not, then the fear that currently serves as a barrier to justice, which we all want to, to see removed, will remain. And the current barriers will only be raised with certainty. Accordingly, if the statutory test for removing the benefits of quarks is vague, this will uh, serve as an open invitation to insurers to challenge a claimant's right to quarks in a large number of cases and the purpose of the bill will be lost. Also lead to satellite litigation. This is a phenom phenomenon uh, uh, known in England and Wales and it's a result of the vague language and legislation there and a desire to push back against advances in the rights of personal injury claimants. This has led to large, long and expensive litigation, not about the subject matter, but instead about the legal costs. Satellite legislation is very expensive, time consuming and in England has clogged up the legal system and this is to be avoided at all costs. Vague and uncertain language in relation to uh, test, the test shall undoubtedly result in satellite legislation whilst the courts grapple with what Parliament intended. And that certainly would be a very disappointing consequence of the, the uh, um, legislation. The high bar that we talked about, um, um, Sheriff Taylor was very clear in this in his report, and indeed in the evidence that he gave to the Justice Committee, that the bar for removing quarks must be set at a high level. The benefit of quarks must be not be lost lightly or easily. Um, so the wording, has, and I quote here, has acted fraudulently in connection with the claim or proceedings or makes a fraud, fraudulent uh, representation. There's a view that, that former works is vague and will lead to satellite legislation, litigation, I beg your pardon. And proportionality, of course, is at the heart of everything and the, the loss of quarks would be extremely harsh and significant sanction, particularly as claimants and indeed trades unions and staff associations who financially support claimants begin the process believing that quarks will apply. The significant sanction must only be imposed when it's proportionate to the wrong committed by the claimant. Now, there can be occasions where the claimant's conduct is inappropriate, but where it would not be proportionate to remove the benefit of quarks. The fundamental position is that the claim, for the claimant to lose the benefit of quarks, their conduct must be materially wrong and must have the potential of having a material impact on the litigation. I, I wouldn't bring forward this if I didn't believe the highest standards of conduct and integrity should apply to a legal process, including this aspect. But as things stand, the court has the power. Of course, it's not to say that it would exercise that power, but nonetheless has the power to remove the benefit of quarks where the claimant does little more than overhanging the pudding. 
that is to say the court could remove the benefit of clocks where the claimant does no more than exaggerate to a very small extent an issue fairly peripheral to the case. Now, it may be entirely reasonable to assume that this would not happen, but it's what the courts could do based on the current wording. The point is not whether or not the court would use its powers in these circumstances. The point is that it's an open invitation to insurers to challenge, and this will lead to a higher level of satellite litigation, which none of us want. So over egg, um, and, uh, but 100% correct and accurate on everything else, insurers would move to withdraw. Now, no one, least of all me, supports fraud. We must have a fraud test. Um, currently, the phrase makes a fraudulent representation is open to defeating the spirit and intention of the bill. Our rules of court are robust and unambiguous, and I'm proposing robust wording. That robust wording in relation to um, qualified one-way cost shifting would not be available when, and this is the amendment, I quote, where the claim is found to be fraudulent or dishonest. Where the claim is found to be fraudulent or dishonest. There's absolute clarity about that, and I hope members will lend their support to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 9A and to speak to the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I'm very mindful of the, the length uh, I spoke at in the previous grouping, so I'll be brief in this one. And, and I'd like to move Amendment in my uh, name, uh, number 9A, and, and speak in support of Amendment 9 in John Finney's name. Um, fundamentally, I think John Finney has summed this up very well. Quarks is uh, uh, it, you know, the key feature, or one of the key features of this legislation is about uh, improving and increasing access to justice, but it cannot be abused, and we must have safeguards about, uh, with regard to that. I think there is, however, some concern about the, the terminology of a fraudulent representation that, that, that was introduced at, at stage two. And this is fundamentally about making sure that that is qualified and clarified, so that people who are simply over-egging their case um, exaggerating, um, uh, uh, but, but not making a fraudulent representation as such, are not caught up in the safeguards that are introduced here. So, with that uh, in mind, that is why we are uh, supporting Amendment 9 and 9A. Um, uh, we note that we think that many of the problems would uh, persist uh, with uh, the government's amendments 10 and 11. However, if 9 and 9A were to fall, uh, we would be supporting those. Um, and I will uh, leave it there. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister to speak to, the, to Amendment 10 and the other amendments in this group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The proposal for qualified one-week cost shifting in Section 8 of the Bill has indeed been the subject of much of the scrutiny at Stages 1 and 2. Section 8, uh, subsection 4A of the bill was amended at stage 2 by two amendments in the name of Liam Kerr, and I stated at that time that I was willing to support those amendments, but that I may come back at stage 3 with some uh, tidying up uh, drafting uh, changes. As a result of that consideration, I have lodged amendments 10 and 11. These are technical drafting amendments. There is no intention to change the effect of the provision, the provision as amended at stage 2. The policy is that a pursuer who has acted fraudulently, whether by fraudulent representation or by other fraudulent act should lose the protection of qualified one-way cost shifting. The legal test for fraud is a high one uh, to satisfy and because it is a high bar, even a single fraudulent act in civil litigation should lead to clocks protection being lost. Share Principal Taylor has been clear that a court finding a pursuer to be uh, simply incredible should not by itself mean that there has been fraud. As with Share Principal Taylor, the government is of the view that the relevant meaning of fraud is the time-honoured definition from Erskine's Institutes in the 18th century, and I quote, a machination or contrivance to deceive. So therefore, uh, an innocent or isolated example of minor exaggeration is not ever going to be fraud. Amendment 10 puts the reference to fraudulent acts in the present tense consistent with the rest of subsection 4. This amendment, together with Amendment 11, makes it clear that making a fraudulent representation is an example of acting fraudulently. Amendment 12 amends section 8 subsection 4b by including a reference to the claim as well as to the proceedings. Although we considered that a reference to behaviour in connection with the proceedings would uh, indeed cover pre-litigation conduct, we think that paragraph sub uh, b ought to be consistent with paragraph sub a because they are both intended to cover pre-litigation conduct. Turning to amendment 9 in the name of John Finney, uh, I, I hear that, uh, of course, he is seeking to, in light of his uh, uh, position throughout the passage of this bill, he is seeking uh, to uh, make sure that the benefit of clocks is not lost if there is a single fraudulent or dishonest act in relation to a claim. I have already 
pointed out that under the government's preferred wording, a pursuer would not lose the benefit of Cox for an isolated instance of exaggeration. That does not come close to fraud as defined in Scots law. The government, and I hope the Chamber, uh, cannot support the proposition that pursuers or we should not forget their lawyers, should be able to act fraudulently in civil litigation without consequence. And I consider that Amendment 9 would have uh, a number of uh, particular consequences. First, it attaches the fraud and the dishonesty to the actual claim itself rather than the behaviour in the pursuit of the claim. Chair Principal Taylor considered that fraudulent behaviour by pursuers or lawyers in connection with a claim should result in loss of quacks. Also, it should be noted that the approach of John Finney's Amendment 9 does not technically work in the context of Section 8 as drafted. Secondly, the introduction of the word dishonest, which has not been discussed in relation to Section 8 at either stages 1 or 2, does, in my view, lower uh, rather than raise the bar required for the loss of the benefit of quarks, which I, I suspect is not uh, the intention of uh, John Finney. Introducing the concept of dishonesty, which is not founded in Chair Principal Taylor's report, would introduce new uncertainty to the qualified one recourse shifting and indeed would be very likely to invite the satellite litigation uh, that Mr Finney was rightly uh, concerned about. Introducing the concept of dishonesty which is not founded in Chair Principal Taylor's report would introduce new uncertainty to the qualified one recourse shifting provisions uh, and uh, therefore I cannot support uh, John Finney's amendment number nine. In regard to Daniel Johnson's amendment 9a uh, it does, uh, by seeking to remove the word uh, uh, dishonest, uh, seek to improve Amendment 9. And for that reason, presiding officer, the government will support Amendment 9A uh, in order that Amendment 9, if it is passed, will not introduce the concept of dishonesty. However, uh, my amendments achieve what Chair Principal Taylor recommended, and therefore my vote for Amendment 9A should not be taken to suggest that the government is supporting Amendment 9. Uh, I consider that the wording in section 84A as amended by Liam Kerr at stage 2 and by my amendments 10 and 11 achieve the desired result. And I would ask Mr Finney to consider withdrawing his amendment uh, and Mr Johnson uh, not uh, to move his, having regard to my strong reassurance that an isolated incident of exaggeration is not going to be deemed to amount to fraud as far as Scots law is concerned. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. I call Liam Kerr. Amendments 9 and 9A in this group, but just for the avoidance of doubt, will vote in favour of Amendments 10 to 12 in the name of Annabel Ewing, which seems sensible for the reasons set out in the purpose and effect notes and the Minister's remarks just now. Uh, in relation to Amendments 9 in the name of John Finney and thus Amendment 9A in the name of Daniel Johnson, in brief, if these amendments were to pass, we believe it could encourage unmeritorious claims. John Finney talks of his robust wording, and I respectfully point out to him, as I, I think the Minister was just trying to do, uh, that I'm not convinced the wording as drafted actually makes sense with the section it's been amended into. Now look, as we shall hear on Tuesday, we believe this to be a good bill, and the end game of access to justice is a good one. However, it is a delicate balancing act in which Parliament must seek to increase access to justice, but not go so far as to create a compensation culture with pursuers seeking inflated and unjustified awards. By limiting the fraud or dishonesty to the claim, Mr Finney's amendment risks exactly that. To lower the bar to simply say that protection is lost where the claim is fraudulent means a genuine claim, bolstered by perhaps overestimates of vehicle repairs, care costs, lost wages or such like, would maintain protection with no sanction. And under Mr Finney's amendment, it would be open to a claimant to perhaps lie repeatedly about a claim or to act fraudulently, but as long as the fundamental claim was not fraudulent, he would retain the benefit. Now, Mr Finney talks of Sheriff Principal Taylor, quite rightly, but Sheriff Principal Taylor was explicit that the benefit of quox should be lost where the pursuer has acted fraudulently in connection with the claim or proceedings or makes a fraudulent, a fraudulent representation. He is right. And let us be clear, a point that Minister, I think, was uh, also making, that acting fraudulently or dishonestly is not the same as a mistake. As drafted, there is no risk to a pursuer who mistakenly claims to something to which they are not entitled. On the contrary, fraud is a deliberate act. It is designed to cheat the system, to, to cheat the defender. Now, the committee heard that over-egging the claim was not considered a concern by some witnesses, and it seems some closer to home. Uh, it very much should be if we are to avoid award inflation and an increase in claims. For these reasons, Amendments 9 and 9A should be rejected. Thank you very much. I call John Finney to wind up on Amendment 9 and to suggest whether he is continuing to move this amendment. Uh, 
Thank you, President Officer. I, I particularly uh, like to, to uh, make remarks about Mr Kerr's last uh, contribution. Um, I certainly would not be party to encouraging unmeritorious or fraudulent claims, and I, I know he's not suggesting that, but I think language is important. And Phrases like compensation culture I find unhelpful in the context of this, this debate when we are talking about access to justice. Um, I, I think it's irrefutable that there will be a challenge from insurance companies um, uh, um, who are trying to rail back against the, the, the culture. Um, but I have to say, I actually have uh, far greater confidence in our existing rules of court than perhaps Mr. Kerr does. And I, and, and, and I think that um, some of the conduct that he alluded to would be picked up in court and, and responded to accordingly. Um, said an officer, I, I've taken real reassurance from what I've heard from the minister um, in particular relation to it, because we all want the highest standards of integrity be, we don't want a situation where um, an element of uh, misunderstanding or someone carried away by events um, it, it means that there are significant financial consequences for them. And in light of what I've heard from the minister, I would ask permission not to press um, Amendment 9. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finney. Does any member object if Mr Finney withdraws Amendment 9? No. Amendment 9A therefore falls. We move to Amendment 10. So I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes, and this is a one-minute division. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 10 in the name of the Minister is yes, 96, no, 19. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister. Minister, move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister? Minister, to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 6, and I call Amendment 36 in the name of John Finney, grouped with Amendments 37, 38 and 39. John Finney to move Amendment 36 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this is about the important issue, as ever, of uh, finance. And uh, the Scottish Government and members will have been perhaps cited in a, an STUC briefing paper on, on this issue. Um, which talks about the Scottish Government issued a response to the three-yearly review of court fees on the 26th of January this year. And in the response they stated, and I quote, paying court fees on behalf of litigants is not an unreasonable burden to place on trade unions. Um, and um, there is the question that needs to be considered and whether this, uh, I, I believe this is the, the legislation, is the, the vehicle to address this issue about the, who should bear the cash flow burden of running the Scottish Court Service. Well, I case progresses through the court system. Now, people will know that the successful party in a court action recovers the legal costs from the unsuccessful party, and it's the unsuccessful party. Uh, th this is all at the conclusion of the case. Um, but at various points throughout the case, it's, um, fees are required to be paid. And um, there is a view that successful litigants therefore effectively lend the Scottish government money while their claim progresses. Now, repeat players. Uh, such as trade unions and staff associations who support hundreds of personal injury claims each year through the Scottish courts lend the Scottish Government there for significant sums of money each year. And uh, in relation to a freedom of information request done in respect of this, 
The total court fees in 2015-16 were 3.8 million. And uh, it was 14% of them that related to personal injury cases. Um, that was 1.9 million. And the court fees paid by claimants in trade union supported cases were roughly one million pounds. Now that's a significant outlay. Um, and um, I think people may well ask, is it reasonable that the Scottish Government receives the, these monies from the trade unions um, when the, there is uh, an opportunity to take a different tack? Uh, one million pounds isn't a lot of money to the Scottish Government. It's a significant num uh, sum of money to those who are representing uh, frontline workers and indeed all workers. Uh, so, um, the, the, clearly the proposal to move away from this would have some uh, implications for the Scottish Government, but I think within a two or three year period, the cost of transition uh, to deferred payment of court fees uh, will uh, be eradicated, any issues of the uh, cash flow um, uh, problems. So, um, the, the Scottish Government uh, talk about two of the issues that, uh, that, that this gives rise to, um, that it encourages pre-legislation, and there are also concerns that this may be uh, issues around bad debt. Well, the people who are involved in that aren't uh, people who you would uh, construe as being likely to be bad debtors. And I think this is the opportunity to, uh, as, as has been raised on a number of occasions, uh, to, to look at this important issue. And I would encourage people to, to support Amendment 10. Uh, sorry, the, the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 37 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment uh, number 37 in my name and speak, of, uh, speak in favour of similar and not contradictory uh, Amendments 36 and 38. And I urge uh, colleagues to support all three amendments. And indeed, I'd, I too would like to give thanks to the STUC for the briefing paper that they circulated. This group focuses on when payments to a court should be made. At present, court fees are paid on a pay-as-you-go basis, which means that for each individual court action, the pursuer must pay up front. For example, the fee for an initial writ in a personal injury court is £219. Lodging a motion is £55. My amendment changes the law from payments being paid on a pay-as-you-go basis to one where those payments would happen at the conclusion of a case. The effect of this um, would be to shift the burden of debt while a case is ongoing from the pursuer and by extension potentially their trade union and other professional body or other funder to the courts. The STUC, uh, through a freedom of information request, as John uh, Finney has already pointed out, uh, uh, would, would assess the impact to be around £1 million. Pounds. And just as uh, John Finney said, this amounts to, in essence, a loan, a short-term loan from trade unions and other bodies to the court service. So, why would this be a positive step? Because of the, the cash flow implications and personal injury cases for trade unions and other bodies has become a real issue. With money tied up in the court system, much of which will ultimately be returned to the pursuer uh, or their funder at the conclusion of a case. And this could prevent cases being taken forward and, and act as a, a barrier to justice. But this also uh, is an opportunity uh, cost of doing the things that we expect from trade unions, organising education and industrial relations. Effectively, as I said, this works out as a £1 million loan from trade unions to the government. So the question boils down to this. Who should bear the burden of running the Scottish court service while courts, cases progress? Trade unions, who could be spending that money on supporting their members and pursuing their interests, or the state. And I would suggest it is the latter. Thank you. The Minister to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the main intention of John Finney's Amendment 36 and Daniel Johnson's Amendment 37 would be to make court fees payable at the end of a personal injury case rather than as under the present system as an action proceeds through the courts. In the case of John Finney's Amendment 36, this would only be in cases where financial assistance is being provided by a trade union or similar body. In the case of Daniel Johnson's Amendment 37, this would apply in all cases uh, where qualified one-way cost shifting applies, irrespective of which uh, body may or may not be providing uh, financial assistance. Similar amendments were debated at stage two and were not supported then. And it is worth reiterating 
uh, for the benefit of members who were not present at that debate that uh, the reasons why pay-as-you-go is the current system for court fees uh, includes uh, the uh, following objectives, encouraging people to resolve their disputes outside the courts, encouraging settlement, ensuring that people value the resource of the court and use those resources wisely, certainly. John Finney. I am grateful for the, member, uh, for the Minister taking intervention on that point. This issue of early settlement has come up previously, but I wonder if you would agree that personal injury cases are subject to a compulsory pre-action protocol, um, and that is an important aspect in shaping which, when the case will be concluded. Well, I, Annabelle I, Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do agree with the member uh, as regards cases up to a value of £25,000. They are subject to compulsory pre-action protocol, but that is the uh, current position uh, uh, in terms of the threshold. The cases above that are not. Uh, and there if, is therefore the important issue that the member himself has just raised of uh, encouraging uh, uh, unfrivolous uh, claims, uh, sorry, rather encouraging frivolous uh, claimants to, uh, to, to settle and not uh, use uh, public resources uh, 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 unwisely. Uh, of course, uh, the pay-as-you-go model actively supports um, the court system. Uh, it supports the objectives of uh, the reasonable management of the courts, of non-frivolous claims being pursued. Uh, and, of course, uh, it allows the uh, fees to be paid uh, in small increments as cases progress uh, through each step of the process. The effect is, of course, therefore, to make parties stop and consider whether they will proceed to the next stage uh, or, or not. Uh, and that is an important element of the uh, 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 negotiation process that is inherent in personal injury uh, uh, proceedings. Uh, uh, of course, in personal injury proceedings, part one of the bill uh, will uh, uh, make it much less likely in terms of damages-based agreements offered by solicitors uh, that there will be any upfront fees, fees paid by uh, pursuers. Uh, and it is worth pointing out uh, again uh, that in uh, terms of section six of the bill, uh, for uh, personal injury actions, uh, it will be the case that the pursuer solicitor will be required to meet all uh, outlays. Uh, and, of course, we should also note that Chair Principal Taylor made no recommendations on changing uh, the position regarding fees in his uh, report. Uh, so the uh, solicitor uh, will pay the outlays, will recover the court fees as part of the expenses recovered from the opponent at the conclusion of the case, assuming it is successful. Uh, and in terms of the qualified one-way cost-shifting provisions for personal injury actions uh, in the bill, uh, the, opponent, uh, the uh, pursuer will not be liable for the opponent's court fees even if they lose their case, uh, assuming the benefit of Cox is not lost. Uh, so uh, I think those points are all very important to be uh, borne uh, in mind in the context of these uh, amendments. Um, all other expenses, including court fees, as I say, are the responsibility of the solicitor. And if it's not clear to me why a substantial benefit should be provided to uh, these providers when that benefit will come uh, with a substantial cost to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and ultimately uh, the taxpayer. I, I, I know that Justice Committee members are aware that there was a recent consultation on court fees and, of course, what we sought to do was to uh, widen uh, the circumstances in which uh, people would be exempt from court fees and I understand that those regulations uh, went through the committee uh, without uh, any particular uh, note being taken. Some of the exemptions in terms of the widening includes increasing the income threshold below which fees will not be paid, uh, includes uh, extending the exemption regime to include recipients of Scottish welfare funds and also uh, those seeking civil protective orders, as was suggested by Scottish uh, Women's Aid. Billing for court fees at the end of the case will place an immense burden on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal uh, service. Um, and of course, that is ultimately a cost for the taxpayer. I think the figure referred to in the letter uh, from the SUC, uh, uh, and I will be hoping to meet with them further to uh, their letter to me, but I think the figure mentioned was a cost of some £1 million to the trade unions. It wasn't entirely clear how that figure was arrived at, but it was suggested that this was somehow a kind of loan to the Scottish Government. This, I would say, cannot really be characterised as a loan to the Scottish Government. This is a, 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 an amount of money that pays for a service, the service that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal uh, Service uh, provides. So there will be a cost. It will have to come from somewhere. Uh, if it is the case that the figure of £1 million is correct, that has to come from somewhere else uh, in the justice budget. Uh, members of the committee will be aware that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service wrote to the committee on 22 February to express concerns about any move away from the pay-as-you-go model for court fees. 
specifically advising against any proposal to introduce a system whereby court fees are paid at the end of the process, uh, uh, given the unintended impact on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, budget. And also, of course, they recommended secondary legislation for the management of fees to retain current flexibility and accessibility to a wider audience. Therefore, both, I have problems both with both amendments 37 and uh, 36. Uh, there is a slight difference in scope, as I said at the outset. However, the end result is uh, the same. Uh, I think it is also instructive to recall uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court recently with regard to employment tribunal fees, where the Supreme Court took the view that they were exorbitant and presented a barrier to justice. Uh, but in striking them down, they also said, fees paid by litigants, and I quote, fees paid by litigants can in principle reasonably be considered to be a justifiable way of making resources available to the justice system and so securing access to justice. I think that uh, explains the position uh, very well. And, presiding officer, uh, I would ask that members do not support uh, amendments 36, 37 and the consequential amendment 38. Finally, presiding officer, amendment 39 in my name simply removes wording which would result in regulations under Amendment 37 being subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, this amendment was introduced uh, at stage, was agreed at stage two, notwithstanding that it was in fact an amendment that was consequent to a substantive amendment which had in fact fallen, if you're still following me, presiding officer, at stage two. So I would ask presiding officer members to support Amendment 39. Thank you. It's at times like this that you're glad you've got a script. <laughs> Um, and before I call Liam Kerr, can I say there's been quite a lot of background noise at times, so please have some care to that. Liam Kerr. Thank you. The Scottish Conservatives will vote against Amendments 36 and 37. I think the Minister makes some important points in relation to the uh, pay-as-you-go system, and there's no need to reiterate those. In brief, we see no reason to provide a special category of exemption in relation to Amendment 36, and for both, we don't think that the impact of this change has been fully assessed and understood. Mr Finney is right, this is about finance, and Mr Johnson is right that this shifts the burden on to the courts, but I'm not persuaded that the ramifications, particularly in relation to the public purse, have been sufficiently thought through, nor if, in fact, the case has been adequately made out, and so, accordingly, we shall vote against. I call John Finney to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you, members, for their, their contributions to that debate there. I don't know if Mr Kerr availed himself of the STUC briefing on, on the paper there, because it does actually mention figures, and it talks about a transition from the system. So uh, this is not... Uh, uh, and the figures arrive from a freedom of information there. So it, it is an informed position, and you don't see the requirement for a, 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 a particular approach to be adopted in respect of trade unions well of course we did that at stage two when my amendment to exclude them from some of the elements of the bill was passed and, and, and lent support so um, as I understand it I mean this issue is not going to go away I think that's the important thing to say this has significant implications for trade unions and staff associations it's not going to go away it's a simple cash flow program in, in some respect there and in, in the scheme of things uh, I don't think this is unreasonable to ask but there's talk of a, a three-year transition to retigate again as the, as the minister confirmed there is provision for early settlement and also on the issue as I understand of one of the other uh, um, uh, um, arguments against this that's been put forward in the past by the Scottish Government about inheriting bad debt. Well, that's not the nature of people that we're dealing with here. So I would encourage people to, to support my amendment and indeed support um, um, Daniel Johnson's. Thank you. Uh, are you. Can you confirm you're pressing your amendment? I'm pressing the amendment. No. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Um, I heard no, there will be a division. Um, you can cast your vote now, and it's a one-minute division.
The result of the vote on amendment number 36 is yes, 25, no, 90, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 37 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with amendment 36. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. The question is, amendment 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. Cast your votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 37 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 25, no, 90, 90, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 13 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 5, minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call amendment 14 in the name, oh sorry, the amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 14 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment five. Could the minister please move formally? Uh, formally moved. The question is that amendment 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. And we now move on to group seven. I call amendment 15 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendment 16 and 33. Would the minister please move amendment 15 and speak to all amendments in the group? Thank you, presiding officer. Part three of the bill has been the subject of less discussion in the parliamentary proceedings for the bill, but it does contain important legal reforms to refresh and codify the arrangements for auditors of court. The key policy proposal is that there will be a transition from self-employed auditors to the position where all auditors of court are employed by the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. There will be occasions when an employed auditor of court is not in a position to tax an account. This might be because that auditor has a conflict of interest or does not have the capacity to undertake the uh, taxation. In those circumstances, the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service will allocate the taxation to another auditor in its employ. The proposal is that there will be a pool of employed auditors just as there is a pool of employed sheriff clerks in the sheriff courts. There may, however, be rare occasions when the pool cannot deal with a particular account. This might exceptionally be because none of the auditors employed by the SETS have the capacity to take on the taxation. Amendment 15 therefore inserts a new section into the bill which provides the circumstances in which uh, no auditor employed by the SETS is, a, is able to undertake a taxation for uh, whatever reason. I should emphasise that I see this circumstance arising only exceptionally and there should not be frequent recourse to this provision given the pool of employed auditors referred to. We will of course continue to monitor the situation going forward as the new arrangements bed in. Subsection 1 provides that the account must be returned to the court or tribunal involved and that the court or tribunal must allocate it to another suitable person for it to be taxed. The suitable person might be say a law accountant, solicitor or a retired auditor of court. Subsection 2A provides that the person taxing the account must be treated as though they were an auditor of court. Thus, the person would have to comply with the statutory guidance uh, under subsection 15 as if they were an employed uh, auditor. Subsection 2B provides that the remuneration and expenses of a person appointed to act as auditor are to be determined by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Amendment 16 is consequential on Amendment 15. Section 16 requires the uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to publish an annual report on taxations. This amendment provides that that report include details of any accounts taxed by a person who is not an auditor of court. This is restricted to information in relation to the account remitted under the new section to avoid catching any other work carried out by that person. Amendment 33 relates to section 3 of the Court of Law Fees Scotland Act 1895 which provides for certain accounts of expenses to be remitted to the auditor of the Court of Session. The accounts concerned are those found due in the High Court of uh, Justiciary or in any inferior court whose judgment has been brought under the review of the High Court 
unless the amount of the expenses is determined or modified, i.e. reduced by the High Court. The Auditor of the Court of Session has to examine and tax these accounts of expenses in the same way and subject to the same rules as accounts of expenses in civil actions in the Court of Session. There are, in fact, only limited cases in which taxation of accounts can arise as regards criminal proceedings. For example, as regards failed uh, bail uh, appeals by the uh, prosecutor. These cases are, are quite exceptional and are provided for in the 1995 Criminal Procedure Scotland Act. The usual practice is for the criminal court to fix or, or, or modify the amount of any award of expenses itself, itself, but it is still competent for the matter to be remitted to taxation. The 1995 Act does not state who is to carry out the taxation, and so the 1895 Act applies. Section 3 of the 1895 Act therefore continues to have relevance to the exceptional cases where a taxation of accounts arises out of criminal proceedings in the High Court. Amendment 33 modifies and modernises Section 3 to make it relevant to the new auditing regime. It replaces the reference to regulations with a reference to rules of court, since the regulations meant were acts of sedarent under Section 32 of the Court of Session Act 1821, which is to be repealed by paragraph 1 of the schedule of the bill. The amendment preserves the requirement that the auditor of the Court of Session should tax accounts arising in the High Court in the same way as accounts of expenses in relevant civil proceedings in the Court of Session. It extends this requirement to accounts of expenses in criminal proceedings in the Sheriff Appeal Court, which will be taxed by the auditor of that court under the rules applicable to civil proceedings in the Sheriff uh, Appeal Court. The same rules of court uh, and common law principles will apply as in civil taxations in the Sheriff Appeal Court, as will the statutory guidance to auditors of court now required by Section 15 of the Bill. The Lord President's private office and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have approved the amendments in this group, which emphasises that, whilst technical, these are important refinements to the new statutory regime for auditors of court. I move Amendment 15, Presiding Officer. Uh, as no one else has requested to speak, does the Minister wish to wind up? Uh, I think I've probably comprehensively... <laughs> the question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15. Minister, to move formally. I moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendments therefore agreed. And that takes us on to Group 8. And I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments... 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 and 40. Um, and I call the Minister to speak to 17 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, at stage two of the bill, the Justice Committee voted by majority to support amendments to section 17 lodged by Liam MacArthur, which specified on the face of the bill that group proceedings should be either opt-in or opt-out proceedings. The intention was that the type of proceedings to be used in any particular case would be specified by the, the, the court. As I have previously indicated, the Scottish Government has no uh, financial or political objections to opt-out proceedings. Rather, we wished to uh, flag up concerns uh, uh, arising as a result of the obligation on the Scottish Civil Justice Council implied in the amendments to uh, draft and consult in rules for both opt-in and opt-out procedure simultaneously, as this risked delaying uh, the introduction of group proceedings in Scotland per se. Lord Gill's Scottish Civil Courts Review drew attention to the fact that opt-out procedure might be appropriate in a consumer case where a large number of consumers are affected. But it also uh, noted that where the potential class membership uh, may be small and easily identifiable, opt-in procedure may be uh, much more likely to be appropriate in order that only those who make a positive choice to opt-in are bound by the outcome. At stage one evidence, the Justice Committee heard about the possible benefits of opt-in procedure from, from, uh, for community groups in Scotland from a number of those submitting evidence. We would not wish small groups to be denied the advantages of opt-in group proceedings whilst opt-out rules are drawn up, which may be more appropriate for larger scale consumer actions. Our concerns uh, 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 were shared by the Lord President who wrote to the Justice Committee prior to stage two to, to ensure that members were aware of the complexities of the opt-out procedure. Uh, the Lord President noted that practical and legal challenges presented by an opt-out model could be significantly greater than those presented by an opt-in model. The amendments I am bringing forward today, Presiding Officer, would permit the
the Scottish Civil Justice Council to develop rules separately for the opt-in and opt-out procedures, whilst at the same time not preventing it from developing the rules concurrently. In other words, uh, the Scottish Civil Justice Council will decide how best to timetable the drafting of the rules. Indeed, it would be open to them as the independent rulemaking body to decide to proceed with opt-out rules first. But the key issue is that it is the Scottish Civil Justice Council uh, that will uh, determine its, its uh, programme of work. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it is clear, therefore, from the on the face of the bill, that there will be a duty on it to provide rules for both uh, procedures. The Scottish Civil Courts Review noted that it would be necessary to amend the legislation relating to prescription and limitation to take account of a group litigation uh, procedure which permits opt-out. It also pointed out that it would be necessary to confer powers on the court to make an aggregate or global award of damages and for the disposal of any undistributed residue of an aggregate award. Opt-out will also give rise to new issues of general principle in that for the first time in Scots law, individuals could become party to litigation without their consent and possibly without their knowledge. In the face of all these issues, if the Scottish Civil Justice Council is obliged to produce rules on both opt-out at the same time as opt-in, then because of the extra complexities involved with opt-out, this risks delaying the introduction of any kind of uh, group proceedings in Scotland. Uh, the SEJC, of course, is an independent body headed by the Lord President of the Court of Session, and whilst the Scottish Government cannot dictate its work programme or the timing of production of its rules, the Scottish Civil Justice Council has already made the public commitment that implementation of this bill will be one of its priorities for 2018-19. We expect that the Scottish Civil Justice Council will set up a working group to consider rules and group procedure, as it did, for example, uh, on fatal acts and inquiries, and that representatives of consumer bodies will be represented on that body. Uh, it is worth noting that the Scottish Law Commission has previously produced a draft act of sederent on opt-in proceedings, and it is therefore to be hoped that the Scottish Civil Justice Council will be able to produce rules on opt-in relatively quickly, enabling it to move on without delay to the more complex issue of opt-out uh, proceedings. I have spoken uh, with Liam MacArthur about the need for expeditious progress to be made on group procedure, and I can give him the assurance that the Scottish Government will use all levers of influence to support the most expeditious introduction of group procedure. Uh, turning to the detail of the amendments, the replacement subsection 7A introduced by Amendment 21 allows the Court of Session to make rules providing for group proceedings to be brought as opt-in proceedings, opt-out proceedings or either of them. The intention is to allow the Court flexibility to provide for all proceedings to be opt-in or for there to be a choice, but also for the Court to be able to make different provision for different purposes. Replacement subsection 7b defines opt-in and opt-out proceedings. Opt-out is defined as a group proceedings where all Scottish domiciled persons within the group description are automatically opted in and therefore must, must opt out to leave the group. However, persons domiciled outside of Scotland must opt in to such opt-out proceedings. And that is because one of the difficulties identified by the Lord President in relation to opt-out was the potential extraterritorial effect of orders granted in opt-out proceedings, particularly when a deemed member of a group would otherwise have had the option of raising proceedings in a different uh, legal jurisdiction. And the government's amendment seeks to address that particular concern and draw in that regard from the UK Com Competition Appeals Tribunal provisions in the Competition Act 1998. Uh, and the consumer organisation of which, which has very much been supportive of uh, the group proceedings provisions has helpfully noted that this is a relevant uh, precedent. Uh, subsection 7b is a replacement for subsections 3, 3 and 3b in the bill as amended at stage 2 which are removed by consequential amendment 17. Care however has been taken in the drafting of the replacement provisions to carry across the relevant wording as introduced by Liam MacArthur at stage 2. Because new subsection 7b small b provides for the court to specify a description of the claims which are eligible to be brought in uh, uh, in opt-out proceedings and because this is not relevant to opt-in proceedings, amendment 8 removes subsection 6a. This does not alter the effect of what was uh, subsection 6a other than to restrict its application to opt-out proceedings. Section 17 uh, 7 uh, AA has inserted at stage two as inserted at stage two places a duty on members of the group as a whole to identify and notify all potential group members. We consider it inappropriate that this duty should be placed on all members of the group with the possible cost and delay which would be involved. And so Amendment 19 places the duty to identify group members on the representative party only. In practice, the government expects 
that the law firm supporting the representative party would carry out the necessary administrative work. Uh, Amendment 20 simply adds some words of clarification to the end of section 177, uh, small double uh, A. Amendment 22 adds to the illustrative list in section 18.2 of the things which the Court of Session may include in group procedure rules. The additions are rules about how a person may give consent for their claim to be brought in opt-in group proceedings and how a person may give notice that they do not consent to their claim being brought in opt-out group proceedings. In other words, how people are to opt-in, opt-out uh, as appropriate. Amendment 23 inserts a new section into the bill after section 18. It enables the Scottish ministers to make further provision about group proceedings in regulations. Amongst other things, this will permit Scottish ministers to make necessary amendments to the substantive law as envisaged by the Scottish Civil Courts Review, which will therefore facilitate the introduction of opt-out group proceedings. The amendment also gives examples of how that power might be used, uh, for example, with regard to uh, uh, the provision for aggregate or global damages, uh, including uh, potentially the involvement of an assessor or actuary, and also provision for the distribution of any surplus uh, damages. Uh, this would largely be done through the modification of common law rules, whereas in the case of prescription limitation, primary legislation would require to be modified. I have been mindful, of course, picking up in the earlier conversation of uh, the fact that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee discourages the introduction of new delegated powers at stage three. In that regard, the Minister for Parliamentary Business wrote to that committee on 16th April, making them aware of the need for the new power, given that this had arisen uh, specifically as a result of an amendment uh, at stage two, voted on uh, by the uh, committee. Uh, presiding officer, Amendment 40 makes the new power in Amendment 18 subject to affirmative procedure, ensuring, therefore, that there will appropriately be full uh, debate and scrutiny for regulations proposed by the Scottish uh, Government. Uh, presiding officer, I think having dealt with all of the key amendments uh, in this group, I would uh, move Amendment number if I find it. Uh, amendment number 24. I wouldn't move Amendment 24. 17. Uh, 17. I'm ahead of myself. As I'm sure many people in the chamber might be uh, wishing uh, they, they were at that stage, which we have not yet reached. So I move, therefore, Amendment 17 in my name. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Yeah, yeah. I'll take a glass of water. <laughs> I call Gordon Lindhurst. <laughs> Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, may I opt into this debate at this stage um, by mentioning my entry in the Register of Interest as a practising advocate. Excuse um, me, Mr Lindhurst, there's an awful lot of chatter going on. Can we have some quiet, please? And li please listen very carefully, you'll say it only once. As we say in court, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm much obliged for that uh, um, plaudit for the comments I'm about to make, which will be very brief. Um, <laughs> well, let, let me start by saying that the Scottish Conservatives will vote for all of the amendments in this group, with the exception of Amendment 23, um, Section 18.1 in the bill already provides for the court of session to make rules by act of sederunt in relation to group proceedings, and that would seem sufficient. Now, I would hesitate to use the words power grab by the Scottish ministers in this context, or indeed in a debate such as this. However, we are not persuaded on these benches that the powers to be given to the Scottish ministers by Amendment 23 relate to matters appropriate to be dealt with in this way. Uh, that is because it gives a power to Scottish ministers to make regulations defining what are substantive matters which are more appropriate to primary legislation. For example, in relation to domicile of a person in Scotland or indeed the prescriptive and limitation periods in relation to claims. And for these reasons, we will vote against Amendment 23. I call Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I somehow feel a bit responsible um, for this uh, section of amendment. Uh, what I, do, I think during the Minister speaks uh, came to uh, appear a bit like the hokey cokey uh, proceedings. Um, I, I think it's probably worth, and I'm sure the Chamber um, is, is, is desperate for me to elucidate the justification behind the opt out uh, approach. But, 
I will do so uh, uh, as briefly as I can. Uh, but can I also thank the Minister for the constructive way in which um, she's engaged with me in addressing, I think, what were legitimate concerns uh, on the back of the committee's decision at stage two to back an opt-out uh, approach. And I think the, the uh, group of amendments here do actually address those concerns while also uh, respecting the decision of the committee. As I said at stage two, enabling group proceedings under Scots law is a big step forward in expanding consumer protection. However, limiting ourselves to an opt-in model would have been a missed opportunity. As which pointed out to the committee, breaches of consumer law often have a relatively small impact on a large number of people. So the cumulative uh, impact is high, but the incentive for any one individual to participate in court, uh, court proceedings is low. To properly widen uh, access to justice in this area, therefore, the availability of an opt-out procedure is essential. They should and will be left to the discretion of the court, taking into consideration the nature and circumstances of a case. I fully accept there will be instances where it would be problematic and indeed inappropriate uh, for an opt-out procedure, and that's why it should only ever be an option. However, as the experience south of the border shows, although an opt-in model was introduced in the 1998 Competition Act, it wasn't until the opt-out became available under the 2015 Consumer Rights Act that real advances were made. It's clear we can't afford to wait a further 17 years for this to happen in Scotland. I'm confident we, uh, that having a reference to opt-out proceedings on the face of the bill will ensure that doesn't happen. I look forward to significant progress being made ahead of the review in five years' time. For now, can I thank the Minister again uh, for her constructive approach uh, to committee colleagues who supported the amendment at stage two, and in particular the team at which, uh, for their perseverance on this issue and on behalf of consumer rights. Thank you very much. Would the Minister like to wind up? Uh, yes, thank you, President. Well, just very briefly on the point that Mr Lindhurst uh, raised. Um, of course, whilst, as I said, the position for opt-in uh, proceedings is such that uh, that can proceed uh, fairly straightforwardly, obviously that's not quite the same with regard to opt-out because there are a number of issues that must be uh, sorted out, some of them being, for example, uh, the uh, provisions on aggregate and global damages, uh, for example, on the what we do with the residue, just to name but two. Um, the mechanism proposed is, uh, through uh, Amendment 23, to do these by affirmative regulation so that the Parliament is uh, duly uh, involved in that. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Minister for Parliamentary Business did raise this issue directly with the DPLRC, uh, and as far as I'm aware, and including at their committee meeting this week, uh, there was no issue raised about what we were proposing uh, to do here. And finally, Presiding Officer, I would just say uh, that a broadly, it may interest the member to note, that a broadly similar approach has been proposed by the UK government in its data protection bill in terms of which the Secretary of State may make provision for opt-out collect proceedings for England and Wales by uh, regulations. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is agreed to. I now call amendments 18, 19, 20, 21 and 22, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with amendment 17. Minister to move amendments 18 to 22 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 18 to 22? The question is that amendments 18 to 22 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. These amendments are agreed, and I now call amendment 23, uh, previously debated with amendment 17. Can I ask the Minister to move that formally? Uh, moved. Thank you. And the question is that amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will therefore be a division, uh, a one-minute division, and you can place your vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 23 in the name of the Minister is yes, 85, no, 28, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We now move on to Group 9, and I call Amendment 24 in the name of the Minister. Grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, please, Minister, to, speak, to move Amendment 24 and speak to all the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Section 18A of the Bill was inserted into the Bill at Stage 2 as a result of an amendment lodged by Margaret Mitchell. It requires the whole Act to be reviewed as soon as practicable following a period of five years, with that five-year period starting on the day of raw assent. Amendments 24 to 31 form a grouping of amendments that make only one substantive change to Section 18A. Uh, although there are eight amendments in this grouping, I should like to emphasise that there is no intention to interfere with the main thrust of uh, Margaret uh, Mitchell's uh, amendments. The Scottish Government does not, uh, however, believe that there is any point in triggering the five-year period for post-legislative scrutiny of Part 4 of the Bill in group proceedings until rules are actually in place allowing group proceedings to, to take place uh, and indeed have had a, a bit of a chance to bed in over that five-year uh, uh, period that is being proposed. Different arrangements are required because the detail of the procedures for group proceedings will be provided, as has just been discussed, in rules of court to be brought uh, forward by the Scottish Civil Justice Council, which will draft and consult in the rules of court which will govern group procedure. Group proceedings cannot take place until such rules are in force. As previously discussed, it will take some time for the uh, Scottish Civil Justice Council to develop uh, group procedure uh, rules. Uh, in the uh, previous grouping, the Chamber indeed has agreed that it will be for uh, that body to decide uh, whether opt-in and opt-out proceedings are introduced at the same time or if one type of proceeding is to come first. But the principle remains, in any event, that some time will be needed for there to be due deliberation and consultation on the detailed rules. This in turn means that the review report envisaged if the five-year period is to run from the assent of the Act itself, may only be able to consider a relatively short period of group procedure operation. I'm not convinced that that is what members intended. Rather, I believe what is being sought is meaningful uh, post-legislative scrutiny on uh, the group uh, proceedings. The government considers, therefore, uh, that as far as post-legislative scrutiny is concerned, Part 4 needs to be dealt with separately from Parts 1 to 3, and so Amendment 24 separates the requirement to review and report on the operation of the Act into two separate reviews and reports. Amendments 25 and 26 apply subsection 2 to the reviews of Parts 1 to 3 and adjust it so that the report on that review does not need to consider Section 17 on group procedure. Amendments 28 and 29 are minor consequential amendments. Amendment 27 replicates subsection 2, but only for the review of Part 4, which includes Section 17 on group proceedings. Amendment 30 starts the review period for Parts 1 to 3 as running from the day of royal assent. Amendment 31 starts the review period for Part 4 as running from the day on which the first rules of court about group procedure come into force. I move Amendment 24. I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to reassure members my contribution at this point will be measured in seconds rather than minutes. Uh, <laughs> The, the more they heckle, the longer I'll take. <laughs> First of all, can I, can I welcome the, 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 this proposal uh, for a five-year review? I think it is a welcome innovation. Secondly, that we will be supporting the amendments in the Minister's name. But finally, I would like to make a small plea that some of the proposals which uh, were made but fell both at stage two and stage three, and namely the inclusion of environmental cases in, in group actions and also the, 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 uh, uh, the pay-as-you-go fees uh, that have been discussed previously, be reviewed uh, if that is possible uh, in the review document. Uh, and that is all I'd like to say. Thank you. Uh, Minister to wind up. Uh, yes, just very briefly to respond to Daniel Johnson's point, and I welcome his uh, support for what is really a pragmatic reflection of what happened at stage two. Uh, it will be for the, those conducting the post legislative scrutiny to set the parameters of that, and I would imagine there would be a number of issues that have been discussed uh, in the uh, passage of the bill uh, that they will wish to pick up upon at that time. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendments therefore agreed, and I call amendments 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 and 31, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with amendment 24. I would ask the Minister to move amendments 25 to 31 on block. Moved on block. 
Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 25 to 31? The question is that amendments 25 to 31 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendments are therefore agreed. And we move on to follow on to section 19. I call amendment 38 in the name of John Finney, already debated with amendment 36. John Finney to move or not move? Not move, President Officer. Does anyone, no, sorry, I'm getting my withdrawals and my not moves mixed up. I call amendment 39 in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment 36, minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 39 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Did I hear a no? There will therefore be a division. I cast your votes now. The result of the vote in amendment number 39 in the name of the minister is yes, 108, no, 5. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 40 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 17. Minister to move formally. <coughs> Moved. The question is that amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is therefore agreed and I call amendment 33 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 15, minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 33 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> the amendment is therefore agreed and that ends consideration of amendments. Yeah. As members will be aware, at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is now required understanding orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a projected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. As agreed by Parliament yesterday, the stage three debate on civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland bill will take place on Tuesday, 1st of May. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 11787 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on the appointment of a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland. And I call on Kezia Dugdale to move the motion on behalf of the Scottish Parliament corporate body. Thank you, President Officer. With colleagues' permission, I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, I speak to the motion in my name as a member of the Corporate Body Appointment Panel to invite members of the Parliament to agree to the appointment of Paul Walker as a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland. The Standards Commission was established by the Ethical Standards in Public Life Act 2002 and its role is to encourage high ethical standards in public life by promoting and enforcing the codes of conduct for councillors and members of devolved public bodies. It issues guidance to councils and public bodies and adjudicates on alleged contraventions of the codes referred to it by the Ethical Standards Commissioner. Under the Act, the members of the Commission are appointed by the corporate body with the agreement of Parliament. 
The corporate body sat as a selection panel on the 26th of March. The members of the panel were the presiding officer, Liam MacArthur, and myself. On behalf of the corporate body, I would like to thank Louise Rose, the independent assessor who oversaw the process and has confirmed by the way of a validation certificate that the appointment process was conforming to good practice. Turning to the candidate from a very strong field of candidates, we are seeking the agreement of the Parliament to appoint Paul Walker as a member of the Standards Commission. We believe that Paul Walker will bring to the post a strong commitment to promoting and encouraging high ethical standards in public life. I'm sure that the Parliament will want to wish him every success in his new role. And, Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. I thank you very much, Mr Agdale. And the question in this motion will be put at decision time. Uh, I'd like to invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to put forward a motion without notice to bring decision time forward to now. Happy to move. Is that the question is... Uh, that we move decision time forward until now. Is the question agreed? Yes. Thank you. It's therefore agreed. There's one question to be put as a result of today's business, and the question is that motion 11787, in the name of Kezia Dugdale, on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, on the appointment of a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed, and that concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.